Okay, let's talk about Sanborn maps of Sauk County. These maps are a relatively unknown resource that can provide a lot of detail and context to historic places in Sauk County. So what are Sanborn maps? What do they look like? Well, they're typically in bound, large bound volumes. They're full color lithographic maps, and when opened up, they open to about 21 by 25 inches. And these maps were created through the latter half of the 19th century, well into the 20th century, and were produced for over 12,000 communities across the United States. Inside the maps covered sections of communities, especially commercial and industrial areas, and the maps were color-coded and communities could have as many as one sheet or several dozen pages. A little background on fire insurance maps goes back to London in the late uh, 18th century and the rise of the fire insurance company there in London during that period after several fires that devastated the city. From 1792 to 1799, a man named Richard Horwood created an enormous map of London and dedicated it to the Phoenix Assurance Limited Company. The map showed every street and building in the city and the Phoenix Company of London also began insuring buildings in the West Indies, Canada, and the United States. In 1790, a map of Charleston, South Carolina was published for the Phoenix Company so that it could more accurately assess risk in the faraway city. Until the War of 1812, London companies underwrote most of the fire insurance in the United States. After the war, of course, there was an aftermath of anti-British sentiment as well as restrictions on foreign companies operating in the U.S. And this gave rise to fire insurance companies springing up in New York, Philadelphia, Philadelphia, Boston, and Hartford, a name, of course, that has become synonymous with insurance. In 1835, there was a massive fire in New York City that did about $12 million worth of damage and wiped out many of the smaller insurance companies. However, larger companies emerged after the fire and started insuring assets that weren't close to home. They were in other communities. And to accommodate this, a man named George T. Hope is credited with starting the idea of specialized insurance maps in the United States. He engaged an engineer named William Paris to make a map of New York City for such purposes. And this is a later version of that map drawn by William Paris. He worked under the direction of a committee formed by George Hope, which directed the project and uh, decided that color codes would be used and symbols used to identify building types and other details in the city that could help assess fire insurance risk. In 1866, a man named Daniel Alfred Sanborn, who was a surveyor from Massachusetts, was engaged by the Aetna Insurance Company to prepare several insurance maps for cities in Tennessee. Sanborn had done similar maps for Boston, and following the successful completion of the maps, Sanborn formed the DA Sanborn National Insurance Diagram Bureau of New York. The company grew steadily, and after Sanborn's death in 1883, the company continued and purchased the firm of Paris and Bourne, started by William Paris, mentioned earlier. Sometimes uh, the maps were called Paris Sanborn Paris maps, but in 1902, the company name was changed to simply the Sanborn Map Company. The Sanborn Company became a monopoly in the market and eventually employed 300 people in the field who visited every state and 400 people in the publishing plant and main office in Pelham, New York. So sometimes you will see Sanborn map and sometimes you will see Sanborn Paris map. In 
And most Sanborn maps followed a standard format depending on the size of the community. A title page often looked like this, and this one for Baraboo 1904 includes an index and background information with the balance of the sheet showing the first sections of the community. So if we zoom in on the corner, we can see in the upper right hand corner, general information and an index to the rest of the pages, and we will take a look at that. So in the circular logo, we have the name of this community, the county and the state, also the date of the map. And it's important to note that a year is given, but also a month. And this can be important if the publication was early in the year, it might not catch a building that was finished uh, later in that same year. Now, there's also a population for the community, probably an estimate, uh, but at the top there you can see 5,700 for Baraboo in 1904. Also, because these were fire insurance uh, maps for fire insurance companies, um, you will see indications of the general conditions in a community, where the prevailing winds were coming from, also notes on the water facilities and the uh, various fire equipment that was at hand in the city. And lastly, you can see the scale at the bottom of the circle, 50 feet to an inch, which was pretty common, although in a few instances, some pages are 100 feet to an inch. Just below the circle or near the circle was often notes on the uh, water facilities and fire department for a community. In this case, in 1904, Baraboo was using 280,000 gallons of water per day in its uh, municipal system. It also had 120 double fire hydrants, good to know, and the fire department, the fire department had 36 volunteers who were paid for each fire. There were two hose carts with 4,000 feet of hose, and the fire department, fire department also had one hook and ladder truck. And there's other information there regarding the fire systems in the city. Now below that is the index, which had a street index uh, showing all the streets that were covered, uh, the block numbers that were covered, and which page it was on. Then we also have a specials index, which might include a specific name for a business and or uh, a general building like a high school or an opera hall. And of course, these were created for people that had never been to these uh, cities, probably never would be. So if somebody asked for insurance for the Island Woolen Company, they could easily find that was on page five. Communities with more than one or two sheets often had a color-coded street map showing which areas of the community were covered and which page number they were on. So in this case, sheet four covers the Baraboo Square and several blocks around it. And if we look at sheet four, you can see exactly that correlating to the smaller street map. Sometimes a sheet had uh, multiple areas of the city and we can see on the the color-coded guide that sheet five uh, has five different sections of the city. So if we look at sheet five, there are five distinct areas that are shown, uh, actually six in this case, and different areas that are not connected to each other are uh, separated by a solid thick black line. So it's important to keep that in mind. These are not uh, next to each other. Most Sanborn maps will have a rudimentary key that helps decode the information on the map. And if we look at a small portion of the 1904 Baraboo map, we can see a lot of colors. And in the key, we can see that red or the pink color are for brick buildings. Yellow are for frame buildings, which would mean they're built out of wood. Blue indicated a stone construction and other colors like gray indicated uh, iron cladding. So if we look at a house at the top of the map here, you can see that it's yellow and pink, and the yellow indicates that it's actually a wood frame house, and the brick or the pink around the exterior 
indicates that it had a brick veneer. So for all intents and purposes on the outside, this looks like a brick house, but actually it's a wooden house inside, and that would definitely affect the fire risk for this uh, structure. Just below, we can see a smaller building with an X across it. An X indicated that this was a stable building. And again, we can see it has a yellow interior, so it is a wood frame building, but it has a gray outline around the edge, and that means it's clad in metal siding. The maps also include street numbers for building buildings, and in this case, uh, there's two numbers. The number closest to the building is the currently accepted number, and further away, if there's another a double number, that was an older number for the building. And sometimes this can help in older city directories and stuff that had a different number system. Now, other things that uh, the key can help us with and the map can show us are the number of stories in a building. So in the corner of every building, there will be a number indicating uh, the number of stories. So in this case, we have a two-story house. And then we also have a one-story dot dashed line, which indicates a one-story porch. Dashed lines indicate open porches, and the number indicates, of course, the number of stories of that porch. The open circle in the map or in the, in the house also indicates the type of roof uh that's on the building so an open circle indicates a slate or tin roof if it had been a black filled in circle it would have indicated a composition roof we can also see on this uh dwelling that there's a dash line down the middle and two letter d's d indicates dwelling and the dash line indicates a partition wall in the middle so obviously with the symmetry of this building it is a duplex and this building still exists today, by the way. It is now called the Baraboo Social Club. Again, another stable on the other side of the block uh, with the X across the entire building. And we see an indication of a story and a half and a street number of six nine or a street address number of 619 and a half. The large uh, commercial building is indicated in blue which means it's stone or in this case cb concrete block and we can see obviously that it's a garage and also a note there uh, important for the fire insurance people that gasoline is kept in eight barrels outside and drawn as used Now, sometimes larger buildings will not only indicate the purpose of the building, but also some of the interior arrangement. And here we can see the Warren Hotel on Baraboo Square, and we can see uh, that it's blue, which indicates it's made out of stone. It has uh, three stories in parts. Uh, 3B means a basement, three stories with a basement. And we see uh, the kitchen is a one story with a basement. Uh, portion of the building and we can also see some of the interior arrangement with an office a saloon dining room and in the back there are sample room down in sample rooms down in the basement with of course the kitchen uh, hiding in the back now there is a larger more in-depth key for the Sanborn maps that you can find on our website and we will go over those resources but this is a downloadable pdf that you can use in deciphering all the different symbols you might find on a sanborn map so what maps are available for sauk county the library of congress holds the largest collection of maps for sauk county as well as the entire country um, and you can see on this list the various uh, communities as well as the years uh, that maps are produced, also the number of sheets for each year. And you can see as the, the community grows and time goes by, 
that uh, the maps will increase in size. Also part of this is the fact that early maps only covered commercial and industrial areas of a community and later maps would get into the residential areas. So that's why Baraboo grows from four and five sheets in the early years to 14 and 19 sheets uh, in the later years. You can also see uh, Reedsburg grew from two sheets at the beginning to nine sheets uh, later. So we have Baraboo. A little bit of West Baraboo is covered on the um, Baraboo maps. And then Reedsburg, of course. And then maps were also produced for Prairie de Sac, Sauk City, and Spring Green, as well as Abelman, or Rock Springs as we know it today. Again, these are available at the Library of Congress website. And also on our website, we have a resource PDF that you can download that has this list and clickable links to each community and each year uh, that maps were produced. So the uh, bold entries are at the Library of Congress. Now there are lists of Sanborn maps online and um, some of those uh, don't, we don't know where they are. For example, the 1927 maps for Abelman are known to exist, but uh, as of right now, we can't find them on any website or any holdings. Also here at the History Center, we have a 1933 uh, copy for Baraboo. A physical copy that is not on anybody's uh, list. So there are more Sanborns out there uh, that aren't known quite yet. In fact, it's highly likely that Prairie de Sac had earlier maps than just 1926 and 1944. So after you download the PDF from our website, um, you can go to the Library of Congress uh, website and this is how it'll look. You can click on the image uh, for the number of to expand the number of pages shown for each community and each year. And then in the bottom left, you can click on a download drop down menu that you can pick the size of resolution and the and the type of map that you want to download. Now, uh, interestingly, uh, each year, or each, about every five to seven years, new maps were made for a community. However, in later years, instead of making an entirely new map, um, maps were turned in and then new additions or changes to the map were simply pasted over an older map. So while this page is labeled 1927, at the front of this volume, it actually says amended to 19. 41. And here we can see a block in Baraboo showing the old red brick Baraboo Junior High, which was formerly the high school, and the new tan brick building, which was the Baraboo Senior High, which we now know today as the Civic Center. But you can see also bleeding through or underneath that uh, change to the 1927 map, the houses that were on the block before the school was built. And even better, if you if you hold these up to the light, you can actually see more clearly the buildings that were pasted over and any changes made to the map. So let's start looking at the Sanborn maps for the communities in Sauk County. 1885 are the earliest maps produced for any community in Sauk County and those were done for Baraboo and Reedsburg. So if we look at Baraboo for 1885, we note that the map has a date of October 1885. Uh, also Baraboo is listed with a population of 4,200, again probably an estimate. And uh, note that the firefighting conditions are quite deplorable. There are no steam and no hand engines, no independent hose carts, and the water facilities are counted as not good. Now, this was not the quality of the drinking water, but the quality of water available or the quantity of water available for fighting fires. And at this point, Baraboo did not have a municipal water system, so it was all wells and cisterns. 
If you're interested in some of the fires that uh, came before 1885, you can find the Baraboo Burning video that was done in 2021 uh, right here on our YouTube channel. And in 1885, on the left there, we can see that Baraboo has four sheets for the 1885 map. And the color-coded uh, areas there show what's, what portions of the city are covered. And basically, it's the downtown area around the square and continuing southward to the south side commercial district on either side of the Ash Walnut Street Bridge. So if we look at the south side of the river, we can see some brick buildings at the corner of Lynn and Bridge Streets, Bridge being an older name for that portion of Walnut Street. We also see at the bottom uh, some railroad tracks and at the very extreme bottom left, the small Chicago and Northwestern Railroad train depot and next to it, the railroad uh, eating house. At the top of the river, or the top of the map rather, we see the Baraboo River where we see the Ash Walnut Street Bridge connecting the two sides of the city. If we zoom in on that, we can see that it is yellow, which means it's a wooden bridge, but it's also noted as a covered bridge, which is 160 feet long. On the east side of the street there, leading up to the bridge, we can see four one-story wooden buildings containing a variety of businesses, including a barber shop, a jewelry store, and the next to that, a bakery and restaurant with a note that there is a brick oven in the basement. Next door is a DG or dry goods and notion store. And lastly, another DG or dry goods and grocery store and general merchandise. So this part of the map can be correlated with an historic photo of this area. And here we can see that the bakery and restaurant are still in the second building from the bridge and the last building that was dry goods and general merchandise is now the j herford boot and shoe store and the background there of course one of uh two covered bridges in in baraboo and one of six covered bridges built in sauk county in the 1870s Just up the street uh, at the northeast corner of Linen Walnut, uh, we can see some interesting things like an old foundation of a building that was destroyed by fire. Very interesting. We can also see um, a building that's labeled as new, so must have been constructed that year or slightly before. We can also see a new uh, addition to the Bender House. Uh, this one being clad in brick, but actually wood frame construction with the yellow inside. And we can see how the Bender House is also divided internally into a saloon and dwelling. Ironically, this building has always been a saloon and is today known as the Old Baraboo Inn. In this corner, of course, uh, was where the Ringling Brothers elephants and all their other animals would turn the corner to go to the rail yard for loading and unloading. And there you can see the Bender House with that one-story addition uh, in the background. Another interesting building on the 1885 uh, Sanborn map for Baraboo is the old Baraboo High School which had been built in 1869 on 2nd Street between Oak and Ash. And we can see from the Sanborn map that it's all pink, which means it was solid brick. The round yellow circle in the middle is indicative of the wooden cupola or tower on the top of the building. And we can see that it's labeled as two and a half and B, meaning two and a half stories with the basement, also an indication there of a French roof which would mean the mansard roof showing in the picture. Now, interestingly, we also see a wooden covered passage leading to a two-story brick building labeled as a privy. And indeed, in the photo, you can see behind the building that two-story uh, covered passage leading to a very uh, large two-story privy. And if we zoom you can see that a little better. This is probably the nicest looking outhouse in Baraboo.
Now, one thing that is indicated on early Sanborn maps is the location of cisterns and wells. This uh, was because there was no municipal water supply yet, and uh, this would help insurance agents assess the risk. How close was water to your building? How easily was it obtained? Um, and today, of course, they can help an historic homeowner know what might be hidden in the backyard. So now we can look at uh, Reedsburg's 1885 uh, Sanborn map, um, again published in October of that year, and the population is listed as 1,400. The water facilities like Baraboo are listed as not good, but Reedsburg had one leg up on Baraboo at least with its um, fire department equipment because there is one hand engine listed and um, that was used with two and a half, with a quantity of two and a half inch linen hose, as indicated there. The Reedsburg uh, Sanborn map for 1885 only has two pages, and uh, because of that, there is no street index um, indicated. So you just have to look carefully at the maps. And here we can see on sheet one, three different areas of the city. Uh, separated by the, the thick black lines with the main street in the middle and some industrial areas on the top and bottom. So if we look more closely at Main Street, this is the west half of downtown with uh, the river at the extreme top left and Water Street we would know today as Webb Avenue. And we can see a variety of wood, brick, and stone buildings, depending on their color again. And we also see a public well indicated in the middle, or not on the side of Main Street. Again, a public water source in case of fire. We also see a stone foundation for a building that uh, either is being built or um, suffered a loss. And we also see a curious note of open drive from hotel. And if we look uh, just to the bottom of the page there, we see the Porter House, which was indeed a pioneer era hotel. And it had a two story uh, main portion with some smaller one story uh, appendages to the north. And here's a picture of that building, which was later called the Bates Hotel. Now, if we look at the east half of Main Street, we show a much more substantial row of brick buildings on the north side of the street, almost an entire uh, complete block. And this can be compared to a lithograph image of the same row of buildings. And you can see at the far end of the block uh, that missing space where we just need to infill one more two-story brick building to complete the block. Looking back at the map and some other things indicated there, we can see, again, two public wells on right on Main Street. And then also at the corner, or here's another building labeled as to be torn down. So that's an interesting note. And on the corner, we see one of the largest buildings uh, in downtown labeled as the Central House. So the Central House was originally built as the Alba House in 1855 and later called the Exchange House and the Central House. And you can see how the building correlates to the Sanborn map and this picture of the building. It was three stories with a main block and a story and a half and one story additions on the back. And you can see that in the picture. And there's also a second story bridge on the back that goes over the alley, probably leading to a privy. And the great thing about the Sanborn map is that it gives us a glimpse of how the inside was laid out as well. And we can see there were a number of businesses in the building with a saloon in the basement, a grocery and dry goods store, and a barber shop in the front. 
also a hotel office in the upper right corner, a dining room behind that, and in the back, a kitchen and storeroom. And presumably the upper floors held the hotel rooms and a ballroom. Now, three-story wooden building. Can you guess what happened to the central house? The building went up in a spectacular blaze in the daytime in April of 1896, and it was recorded uh, in photographs, and you can see all the people there watching this pioneer era relic uh, burn to the ground. Uh, this cleared the way for a grand new hotel and store building built by William Stolte at a cost of around $20,000. Incidentally, the building had nine miles of wiring, so it was up-to-date electrically, but it was not so un well endowed with uh, plumbing. It did have indoor plumbing, but it was still relatively new, and although the building had hot and cold running water, the guests in its 39 guest rooms had to share toilet facilities and the three bathtubs in the building. Not all at the same time, of course. And of course, the next Sanborn map uh, in 1898 for Reedsburg shows the new Hotel Stolte on the corner where the Alba House had been. And this time we can see it's a substantial 3B or three stories with basement solid brick building. And we can see some angular and corner uh, round protrusions. These are the bay windows. And we can see that they're gray, which means they're clad in steel. Also note on the right side of the building, there's a drive indicated uh, where people could come off of Main Street and access the alley by driving under a three-story building. And today we know this building as the Cornerstone Building in downtown Reedsburg, one of the finest examples of Queen Anne commercial architecture in the state of Wisconsin. Now, both Reedsburg and Baraboo had their next maps issued in 1892. And also that year, a map was issued for Sauk City in November of 1892, so quite late in the year. And we can see that Sauk City had a population of 900. It was also listed with two hand engines for uh, firefighting, as well as one hook and ladder truck and 1,500 feet of hose. And again, the water supply is or water facilities are listed as not good. The 1892 map for Sauk City included only one sheet, concentrating on the downtown area at the bridge crossing and some other areas of the community uh, boxed off in the corners of the map. So using the Sanborn maps, we can often help uh, decipher old pictures and get a sense of what was uh, there before. If we look at uh, this photo of the well-known bridge corner in Sauk City, or the Quick Trip Corner, as some like to call it, we can see uh, that we're looking south, and just to the left would be the bridge across the Wisconsin River. A similar uh, view of that same area from more than 100 years uh, earlier shows a number of buildings that aren't there anymore and it can be confusing to know exactly where you are in relationship to modern day. But on the right side we can see that there are some one and one and a half story uh, wooden buildings and then just behind that a larger much more substantial building two stories with a two-story porch. And if we look at the Sanborn map for that area, we can see indeed on the corner are some one and one and a half story wooden buildings. And then just behind that, a two story brick building 
labeled the U.S. Hotel. The, the hotel was built in about 1850 and was later enlarged. And we can see that it is, of course, solid brick construction. And then it had a hall on the second floor and a saloon in the basement. And here's a picture of the U.S. Hotel. And this was used for a hotel for many years. And in 1937, it became the Village Hall for Sauk City, as well as the library. And the building was ultimately destroyed by fire in 1960. So going back to the Sanborn map, we can uh, get our bearings again and see how it compares to today's landscape. So using the Sanborn map compared to modern uh, aerial photography, we get the following. And we can see on this uh, modern imagery the Quick Trip uh, gas station with the, uh, the pump island canopy and uh, the store itself sitting right on the same area as the U.S. Hotel. And we'll fade back through to the Sanborn map so you can see once again where the hotel sat in relationship to these buildings. So next time you're pumping gas at Quick Trip in Sauk City, you can think about the dressmaker and millinery shop on the corner, as well as the U.S. Hotel that used to sit in that location. Now the Sanborn map also shows us uh, an earlier street name, Bryant Street, is now known as Phillips Boulevard. And we can see the Iron Bridge at that time that crossed the Wisconsin River coming straight off of Bryant Street or Phillips Boulevard. And if we look back at the modern imagery, we can see a, quite a bend in the road and the bridge is not in the same location. And uh, this can be explained by the following photograph. In 1922, the old iron bridge in that earlier Sanborn is shown there on the left and a new bridge was created and dedicated in 1922. And because they had to keep crossing the Wisconsin River while, while it was being built, the old bridge was used until the new bridge was ready and then was uh, torn down. So that's why there is a bend in the road and a larger intersection in Sauk City to this day. Spring Green joined the Sanborn Map Club in July of 1894 when a map was published for that community. You can see that Spring Green had a population of around 800 at the time and firefighting equipment included two hand engines, two independent hose carts, and one hook and ladder truck. And the water supply was listed as good with C note. And the note indicated that the village had a Howe triplex pump with a capacity of 250,000 gallons, and that it was run by a Foss gasoline engine and drawing from six driven wells. So quite uh, the feat for Spring Green. One of the largest buildings uh, downtown was labeled as the Park Hotel. And you can see two park hotels, the building on the corner with the L shape, as well as a park hotel in the back, which says to be removed. And what was going on here is the map maker caught the new park hotel being constructed in 1894 in front of the old pioneer era park hotel in the back. Of course, the old building was all wood, and you can note that the new building uh, was built of wood, but clad in brick on the outside. This was uh, also known as the post block. The entire building was constructed by original owner, Mr. G.W. Post. And you can also see that the building was slated to have an opera house on the second and third floor.
And there we can see the not finished notation. And this is how the post block looked when it was finished. A very imposing building, really one of the largest commercial structures at that time in Sauk County. Neither Baraboo or Reedsburg had a building this big. But as we saw on the Sanborn map, this building had an Achilles heel. Because while it looked like it was all brick, it was actually a three-story wooden building with a brick veneer. <clears throat> so here's the 1899 Sanborn map for Spring Green, and we can see how the building was finished out and what it was used for. And there's a lot going on from a barber shop in the basement of the building to a general store on the north side of the building, a harness a shop, as well as a B&S, which would be a boot and shoe store. And on the eastern wing of the building, the Park Hotel, which included a dining room, as well as a jewelry store. And again, that opera house is indicated on the second floor of the building. In the back, the old Park Hotel building has uh, been long since removed, and we see a two-story kitchen wing for the hotel. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the building did have an Achilles heel. It was built basically of wood, and the blue lines in the interior of the building indicate firewalls that were clad in metal, and these did uh, help the building uh, through two different fires. The first fire occurred in 1915 when the uh, western wing of the building that had the opera house uh, burned and the Park Hotel portion was saved by that firewall. Where the Opera House had been was uh, replaced with the Guard Theater in downtown Spring Green. The uh, hotel portion uh, later became known as the Post House, which had a long running restaurant inside and then operated for another just about 100 years after that 1915 fire. But alas, the uh, post house did succumb to a spectacular blaze in 2004. This time the uh, firewall worked in reverse and helped save the guard theater next door. Able Men, or Rock Springs as it is known today, had a sandboard map uh, produced in November of 1912. It's a simple one sheet. Uh, for the community, including most of the downtown, as well as several other areas around the village. We can see that the population was around 400, and there was really only uh, a limited amount of fire equipment, including one knot combination, H and L, meaning hook and ladder and chemical engine uh, truck. And of course, the water supply was all private well. And again, sandboards can help us identify and date pictures. So here we have a picture of Rock Springs or Abelman, noted as Street Scene, Abelman, Wisconsin. And we can see there's a hotel and saloon on the left and more commercial buildings in the distance, including that two-story porch commercial building on the left and a one-story porch building, commercial building on the right. And if we look at the Sanborn map, we can indeed see a saloon and hotel on the left side in the front and a two-story uh, porch at the Door Hotel further down the street and on the right side corresponding one-story porches on commercial buildings. So we know the direction of the photo is looking uh, west and we can also make a cutoff for what buildings are shown in the picture. Now, the Library of Congress holds a copy of the 1926 Prairie de Sac Sanborn map. It's highly likely that there are earlier Sanborn maps for uh, Prairie de Sac, but as of yet, nobody knows 
uh, where they are. In 1926, uh, Prairie du Sac had a population of about 950, and you can see on the street grid that the map covered the commercial district and a fair number of houses in the community. The village had a modern water supply and a modernish fire department as evidenced in a lengthy note. There was plenty of water and 33 double fire hydrants throughout the village. Uh, the fire department though was not motorized and consisted of 32 volunteers directed by a chief and assistant chief. Also note at the bottom that there was indicated a mile and three quarters of concrete paving. Good to know in um, uh, running fire equipment around the village. And it was also noted that the grades were level, meaning that the streets were flat. Also helpful when using those two hand-drawn hose carts. Also of note on the 1926 Prairie de Sac Sanborn map is a um, indication of the Wisconsin River Power Company or the giant hydroelectric uh, dam and plant that had been built on the Wisconsin River about 12 years before. Prairie de Sac also has a Sanborn map issued in 1944, and that would make it the latest map for any community in Sauk County. It's also one of the most complete maps as it covers virtually the entire village. The population is listed as 1,050, but this probably doesn't include the hundreds if not thousands of extra people in the area working at the powder plant during World War II. So with this map, we see large sections of residential neighborhoods covered. And you might notice that the scale is a little bit different. It's actually 100 foot to an inch, so the buildings are quite a bit smaller. Down at the bottom there, you can see Marion Park with a lot of vacant lots to the south and east. And if we zoom in on the park, you can see the pavilion and bandstand as well as the municipal swimming pool and bathhouse and the Prairie de Sac High School, which in this case is consisted of three parts and has been labeled for us as to the years of construction. So we have the original portion built in 1915, an addition in 1924, and a gymnasium that was added in 1930. You don't often see dates like this on a building, so it's nice to have them sometimes. Now, one of the most useful things that Sanborn maps can be used for is com comparative analysis through time. And if a community has a series of maps uh, with the same area shown, you can obviously track different buildings uh, as they came and went. So we can take a look at the north side of the square in Baraboo through a series of several years and see how it developed. So here in 1885, we see a, a relatively uh, open north side of the square with the Warren House that we saw earlier anchoring uh, the east corner and a series of small wooden and some brick buildings uh, uh, occupying the rest of the block. The Wisconsin House uh, was a pioneer era hotel that was built in stages with uh, two brick portions on the right being the earliest and then a larger wooden portion added uh, later in 1867. And here's a picture of that building showing those two brick portions on the right side and the wooden uh, addition to the left. We can also see another small brick structure and this was actually uh, one of the original county buildings uh, in the city. Uh, nearby was the uh, first wooden courthouse in Baraboo, actually the second for the county, the first courthouse being in Prairie de Sac. And by state law, they were required, the county was required to have a brick structure to house county records. 
and that was this building which was built around uh, 1850 and still survived uh, for many years. Now keep your eye on the little cobbler shop here. This is a one-story uh, wooden building and it will have a story to tell in just a little bit. So we'll now fade through to the 1892 map for the same area. You can see quite a bit of change around the little cobbler shop. We have five new brick buildings, two on one side and three on the other side. And these were all built in 1886 and included a harness shop, a steam laundry, a restaurant and saloon, a printing shop, as well as a bank next to the Warren Hotel. Fading through to 1898, we see a few more additions, especially on the west end of the block, where we have a new building uh, built of wood frame, but clad in brick. Uh, this was originally the uh, printing office for the Baraboo News, and today we know it as the Little Village Cafe. Fading through to 1904, we can see another new building at the west end of the block, and this is labeled the Wellington Hotel. And a picture of this building confirms that it was a three-story building uh, with a kitchen and dining room. And going further to 1913, we see a rather dramatic change in the block. The old Wisconsin house uh, is gone, and this indeed was purchased by Al Ringling in 1912 and torn down to make way for a new theater. However, Al Ringling did not get around to building right away in 1912, so this area sat as a vacant lot uh, during the summers of 1913 and 1914. And ironically, a big top tent was put up by uh, a, a vendor and silent films were shown on the site of the future theater. And finally, going through to our last uh, map from 1927, we see the complete block with the Al Ringling Theater built with the dramatic elliptical auditorium uh, shown on the plan. Also notice up the street that the uh, one-story cobbler shop is finally gone and we'd like to tell you a little bit about that story. So we go back to the 1885 map. Again, we can see the little one-story cobbler shop. And in 1886, new brick buildings were built on either side. And we can see these on either side of the cobbler shop in the 1892 map. Now back in 1886, the people that were building the new buildings really wanted Mr. Schultz to join in and complete the row of buildings with a two-story brick building. This would have been rather easy for Mr. Schultz. He could have used the party walls on either side and basically built a facade, a roof, and a rear of the building. However, Mr. Schultz either didn't have the money or the will to join in the building frenzy. So here is a picture of 4th Avenue with Mr. Schultz's cobbler shop in the middle. And while the Dickey Ashley block was being constructed to the left, uh, when there was a cellar hole there, in the middle of the night in August of 1886, 
Some men uh, borrowed some timbers from the lumber yard on the west side of the square and tried to tip Mr. Schultz's one-story cobbler shop into the cellar hole that had been dug for the building next door. However, all of this ruckus raised uh, someone's interest at the Warren Hotel up the street, and they blew the whistle and the men dispersed before the deed was done. So Mr. Schultz's cobbler shop was not wrecked. It was damaged heavily, but it really made him mad, and he stayed there, uh, the building stayed there for another 30 years before it was replaced. Now, people were so embarrassed by this little one-story building that when this lithograph drawing of the street was done in 1888, the artist conveniently omitted Mr. Schultz's one-story cobbler shop, which should be shown between these two buildings. And here's a picture of the cobbler shop um, sometime around 1918 and you can see it next to the Dickey Ashley block next door. Finally, in 1921, the old cobbler shop was torn down and a new brick two-story building was built to complete the row. So the next time you are at the Baraboo Burger Company, remember Mr. William Schultz and his poor little cobbler shop. I'd like to close out our time looking at Sanborn maps uh, by looking at a few unique things that uh, can be found. One of those is the Octagon House uh, in Baraboo. This was originally built up in the village of Newport along the Wisconsin River in the 1850s. And when that community died, uh, the Octagon House was cut into pieces and transported to Baraboo in 1863, where it was reconstructed at the southeast corner of 4th Avenue and West Street. We also find the Octagon House on the 1870 bird's eye map for Baraboo. And just a few years ago, a picture of the Octagon House finally arrived at the History Center from descendants of one of the uh, owner families. And using the Sanborn maps, we can tell exactly what side of the house this is with the uh, projecting porch there to the right side. You can also see on this photograph that it's probably early enough that a wing to the west or east side of the house is not shown in the photograph, so it came a little bit later. The Sanborn maps also can help tell the story of what happened to the Octagon House. This is the same corner on the 1927 Sanborn map, and we see that there are now two houses on this uh, on these lots. They're kind of mirror images of each other, so uh, probably built by the same uh, people, and we can see that they're wood frame houses with brick veneer. Um, and indeed, the Octagon House was demolished around 1918 by the Muller brothers, and they built these two houses on the same spot using lumber salvaged from the Octagon House. And here are those two houses today. And upstairs they have uh, plain craftsman style woodwork and uh, spindles on the staircase. But down in the basement they have these much more fancy uh, turned oak uh, staircase spindles. And these are most likely from the octagon house that was once on the spot. The Reedsburg 1912 uh, map on sheet one has uh, the layout of the Sauk County Farm, often uh, known as the Sauk County Poor Farm, uh, later known as the Sauk County Healthcare Center. Uh, but this is kind of a 
neat look at that uh, county facility south of Reedsburg. And the Baraboo 1904 map on sheet two has Ringlingville. And we can compare that to the 1913 map, which shows the expansion of Ringlingville just a few years before the Ringling Brothers show left uh, Baraboo for good in 1918. Well, that wraps up our presentation on uh, Sanborn Maps. You can find uh, the Sanborn Map information on our website at our homepage by clicking on Research and in the drop-down menu clicking on Sanborn Maps. That will take you to this page where you can find links to not only the list of Sanborn Maps, and the uh, links to go directly to the Library of Congress website, but also uh, that downloadable key that I talked about earlier in the presentation. So you'll find all of that at SaucCountyHistory.org. You can also join at our website and become a member of the Sauk County Historical Society. We are a member-based organization with over 800 members from across the country that support uh, what we do in collecting, preserving, and sharing Sauk County history, and we truly could not do that without member support. You can also download our new app on your mobile devices at the App Store or the Google Play Store. Just search for Sauk County Historical Society or you can scan the QR codes on the screen. And again, I would like to thank you for coming to this presentation of Sanborn Maps of Sauk County.